Welcome to video six of section three, focusing on the interview. This video is a catch-all of a bunch of really cool features in A to J Author. This video will have six mini segments covering each of the bonus features shown here. We'll talk about the just-in-time learning features of Learn Mores and pop-ups. We'll cover the ways to call up and manipulate data within the interview with macros and functions. Then we'll talk about easing the authoring burden with the merge tool. Finally, we'll cap off this section with repeat loops, which let you gather the same types of information multiple times from an end user. Let's talk now about the just-in-time learning features of the Learn Mores and pop-ups. A to J Author was designed for self-represented litigants. Besides our avatars, the thing that sets us apart and puts the focus on self-represented litigants is our just-in-time learning tools. Just-in-time learning features are tools within A to J Author that allow you to provide additional information, explanations, and definitions just at the point in the interview in which the end user will need that help. This can be in the form of text, graphics, and or videos. The idea is to help the end user right at the point in which they may be getting stuck, ensuring that they can process and use what you're telling them without overwhelming them. Other tools, even paper forms, can have instructions or additional legal information, but it's often presented in a long block of text at the start of the form or a separate instruction sheet. Automated forms, especially those created in A to J Author, can break down that information into digestible bits right when the user needs it alongside the question they're being asked to answer. A Learn More is one of the two just-in-time learning tools within an A to J guided interview. Learn Mores allow authors to provide additional information just at the point in the interview in which the end user needs it. You've asked them a question and you anticipate that the end user may have some difficulty answering it. So you put that additional information in the form of a question and answer that's available to them if they need it. Learn Mores are structured in a prompt and response format. The prompt is the question the end user thinks and the response is the answer given by the guide avatar. Learn Mores can be plain text. Within the text, you have all the formatting options of the page text section, including the ability to add hyperlinks to additional external information. Here, for example, I've linked out to a county lookup based on zip code for the end user who may not know what county they live in. You can also use this space to give examples of how similarly situated people answered this type of question, explain complicated legal concepts, or provide more context than space generally allows in the question itself. Only the user who clicks the Learn More button will be shown this additional content so it doesn't overwhelm an another user. Another great use of the Learn More space is with a graphic. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. For example, you need to know what the case number is in an answer that you're helping a user to draft to an eviction filing that their landlord filed. You can explain that the case number is found in the caption and that the caption is found at the top of the eviction papers they've received that the case number is usually along the right-hand side and starts with the year followed by a dash and some additional numbers. Or you could include a picture of the paperwork that they should have received with a big arrow pointing to the case number area in the caption. A Learn More can also contain a video if you prefer to add a longer explanation or a video you've created for other purposes. Videos are less commonly embedded into Learn Mores than other content types with many people linking out to videos hosted elsewhere like on YouTube, but we offer it as an option within the Learn More. You create a Learn More in the Question Design Editor for each page that you want it on. If you remember from the Question Design Editor video, the Page Editor is structured as either a scroll to see it all, which is the default view, or a tabbed view. Either way, the Learn More Info section, as shown here on the screen, is where you want to scroll or tab to to get started creating your Learn More. Learn Mores are structured in a call and response format with the prompt being the thought or question the end user avatar has and the response being the reply given by the guide avatar or the author. Let's go through the Learn More fields one by one. The citation field for adding any notes that you might have about where you as the author got this content or why you included it is first. This isn't visible to the end user. The media label is an accessibility enhancement meant to tell a screen reader whether the media you're including underneath the text is alternative or supplemental. If it's supplemental, the user should go over it. If it's alternative, they can skip it if the text that's being read expresses the same ideas. You can attach audio files in MP3 format and graphics as JPEG or PNG files. 
When attaching graphics, you should always include a graphic alt text tag. This is generally a description of the image under 100 characters long for the user that's reading the content with a screen reader and can't see the image. You can also attach a video in MP4 or GIF format to the Learn More. When attaching any videos, you should include a video transcript for accessibility purposes as well. You can learn more about why we've added these accessibility enhancements and how to optimize your A to J guided interview for all end users by checking out our accessibility checklist under the About tab on www.a2jauthor.org. The other just-in-time learning feature is a pop-up. Pop-ups are most commonly used to define legal terms that may not be familiar to an end user. Remember, the target audience for an A to J guided interview may have a fifth grade reading level, be in a stressful situation, and may not speak English as their first language. In almost all cases, they won't have any legal training, so it's crucial to define legal terms and concepts for them, particularly when you're asking them to apply those terms and concepts to their lives. A pop-up appears to the end user as a blue word in the sentence. Many authors have a short explanation at the beginning of an A to J guided interview explaining that blue words are clickable definitions, what learn mores are, and how to navigate around the interview. There are two parts to adding a pop-up to your interview text. First, you have to create the pop-up, then you have to attach it to the word or phrase you want to define or explain. You create a pop-up by clicking the new pop-up text at the top of the pages tab, as seen in this left side screenshot. That opens the pop-up editor. The pop-up editor is nearly identical to the Learn More Info section in terms of what can be added. There's a pop-up name and notes section. Both of those are just for the author to see. Then the text of the pop-up, text audio, media label, the ability to add additional audio, graphics, and videos. Then the accessibility enhancements of the media label, graphic alt text, and the video transcript. At the bottom, you can close and save your pop-up or preview what it would look like to an end user. Once you've created it, now you have to add it to your page text. To do this, you create the text in the question design editor. Then you highlight the word or phrase that you want to make the pop-up. Then click the P in brackets icon in the text editor. That will open up a list of all the pop-ups you've created and you select the one you want to use and click change. This attaches the pop-up to your highlighted word or phrase. You can add additional pop-ups then to other words or phrases. You can reuse a pop-up multiple times. So anywhere you use legalese, define it. If you really want to be crazy, you can have a pop-up within a pop-up within a pop-up. I generally bug fix test up to three pop-up inception levels deep, so don't go too crazy or you might bump up against our testing limits on quality control, but multiple pop-ups within a pop-up are possible. All of the pop-ups that you've created will be under the pages and steps on the pages tab. Pop-ups can be used for more than just definitions. This example is from an eviction interview by Lone Star Legal Aid. They use pop-ups more like learn mores and add additional content to them beyond just a definition. Here they have two pop-ups inside their question. One shows a graphic of an example notice to vacate. The second one is a video that explains what it means to get a notice to vacate. The only limitations with either of these just-in-time learning features is author imagination and the amount of time available to create them. Now let's talk about variable macros. I love peppering my A to J guided interviews with macros because they pack a lot of bang for their buck. What I mean by this is that they take your interview to another level of personalization and professionalism with almost no authoring or programming effort at all. I'll show you what I mean. A variable macro is a way to call up the value of a variable and display it back to the end user. It uses the information the end user has already given you, in this case, the user's name, and displays it back to them. It makes the end user feel like you are talking to them specifically. It can also be used to remind them of information you've given them in prior screens. You can also use a variable macro in several different spots in an A to J guided interview. You can use them in the question text, a learn more prompt, that's remember that's the question the user avatar asks, a learn more response, that's the answer the guide avatar gives back, in radio button or field labels, and in the signposts along the path the user is traveling to the courthouse. Anywhere you use it though, you use this formula. It's double percent signs, open bracket, variable name, close bracket, double percent signs. This tells A to J author to call the value of that variable and to display the value in the text, not the variable name. 
Most commonly, a macro is used in question text to recall the user's name. It's an easy way as an author to make your interview look next level. The user feels like you are talking to them instead of an impersonal software interaction. You can use a macro in a learn more prompt. In this example, the user is prompted to name someone as their agent. Then there is a follow-up question about whether they want that person to have guardianship over their child as well. The user may wonder what ramifications this could lead to, so you can give them additional learn more help and explain why they might answer one way or another. Likely, this person, Ann Martin, in my example on the screen here, is someone the user is close with. They'd be more comfortable calling them by their name rather than agent, so the learn more prompt will make more sense to the user and be more natural, and you already know the person's name anyway, so use Ann's name instead of the word agent. Rather than saying, why would I want my agent or this person to be my child's guardian as well, you can say, why would I want Ann Martin to be my child's guardian as well? Macros can also be used in the answer that the guide avatar gives to that prompt. Here again, we're reusing the agent's name in the response to be crystal clear about who we're talking about. This is another one of those easy to do authoring tricks that can have a big impact on the end user's overall experience. Another place that you can use a macro is in a radio button label. This dynamically creates the options for your end user to select. The only drawback here is that you have to know ahead of time how many options you'll be presenting to the end user. You can use macros and other field labels too. Here's an example where I call out the agent's name in the field label for a text long field. Finally, macros can personalize the step signs along the pathway for the user. This example is one in which I ask the end user for their name and their spouse's name. I then use this information to populate the step signs for the series of questions that I'll ask about them and their spouse. Again, this is dynamically changing the user's experience based on data that they have given you. Before this logic shown here, the step sign said my information and spouse's information. They were set normally on the steps tab and I added this macro to logic. Here are some other real world examples of the benefits of macros for improving your interview's user experience. The first one is used when you have to ask follow-up questions and you can't know whether the correct form of the word is plural or singular. In this example, I want to ask if the user's children live with them, but I don't know if the user has one child or multiple children when I'm drafting the questions. Since I need this information anyway, I ask for the number of children, then use logic to set variables that I'll use in my macro on a follow-up page. In this case, I want to set the correct word for child or children and the correct corresponding verb form for do or does. If the number of children is one, I set a variable called child or children te to the word child and the variable do or does te to the word does. Else, meaning the number of children is greater than one, I set the variable child or children te to the word children and the variable do or does te to the word do. I don't need to worry about whether the user has no children because I've done branching that doesn't show this question to people who say they don't have any children at all. I then use those two variables to correctly format the follow-up question displaying in the GIF with the macros to call out do or does and child or children depending on the user's answer to that prior number of children question. Another useful way to use a macro is to remind a user of information they've already told you or to confirm an answer. The New York courts are a longtime power of user of A to J guided interviews, and they use verification screens frequently. In this scenario, you'd ask the user for an answer, then branch them to a follow-up page that displays that information back to them and asks them to confirm it. This can be useful when you're using a function to add up numbers a user has given you, like monthly expenses or sources of income, or when they've picked from a list and it's very important, so you want to make sure they selected the right answer. So macros are a way to display data given to you by the end user, but functions are a way to manipulate that data. All functions follow the same formatting rules. The name of the function in all caps, then parentheses, then the variable name wrapped in brackets. Technically, you only need the brackets if your variable name has a space in it, but for safe measure, I always wrap the variable name in brackets. Functions can be used throughout your interview in all text fields, so pages, learn mores and pop-ups, they can also be used in the logic section. We'll go through each of these functions individually, but here are two examples of them at work. In the logic example, I ask the user for their date of birth. 
I need to know if the user is over 18, and if they are, I need to know their birth date for the form. So instead of asking the adult end user two questions, I ask everybody the birth date question. Then I use logic and the age function to calculate their age based on their date of birth in relation to the day that the interview is being run, then compare that to the number 18. If they are less than 18, they get, to, they get kicked to a sorry, you don't qualify page. If they are over 18, they move on to the next section of the interview. For the text example, I have asked the user what date they received the notice. I know that they have to file a response 30 days after that date. To make it easier for the end user, I add 30 days to the notice date that they give me, and then I use the date function to convert that back to an actual date. Then I also use the number and today functions to give them the number of days that they've had so far. It's easier for a user to understand an actual date, like May 31st, than making them do the calculations and say something like, you have to file this within 30 days after the notice date. Functions can make the data collection process more efficient for authors, but they can also be used to smooth out the process for the end user. Now let's walk through all the functions. The first one to talk about is age. Age converts a date to an age in years. The syntax is the word age, open parentheses, open bracket, date variable, close bracket, close parentheses. I showed you the use case on the last screen, but the idea is to never ask an end user for a birth date adjacent question if you've already got their birth date. Just reuse that information that you have and convert it to whatever format you need it. The next one is date. This converts a date variable into month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. Generally, date variables are stored in Unix time within A to J author, which means time in relation to January 1st, 1970. It's a decimal. If you want to display that decimal number in month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format, you use the date function. The syntax is the word date with parentheses and brackets wrapping a date variable. I get to reuse my screenshots here with the today function. Today returns today's date. It's my favorite function because I can also use it as a calendar limitation for a min or max date. So it's really a lot of bang for my buck as far as functions to remember go. In this use case, I'm using it as part of a larger equation where I want to know how many days it's been since the notice date. So I set the notice date up against the function today. A to J author always knows what day it is when the user runs the interview, so it is always up to date on today. The sum function is one used with number variables in a repeat loop. It totals up all the values held by that variable. In this example, I'm asking the end user for information about their monthly expenses in a repeat loop. You'll see this example again in the repeat loop section coming up, but I ask for the name and the dollar amount of each expense. Then I ask the user if they have any more to tell me about. In the question text, I use the sum function to add up all the amounts they've told me about already to display their to date monthly total. I assume it's more likely for an end user to know that their monthly bills are about $3,000 a month. So if their total is only 750, they know they have more to tell me about. Additionally to note here, in the learn more, I've also paired this sum function with a macro that displays all of the names of the expenses that the user has already told me about. So the point at which they have to answer the do you have any more question, they have the total they told me about with the sum function and they'll be able to see the list of responses that they've input already if they want to in the learn more. Has answered is a function used to literally check if the user has answered a variable. It responds with a true or false value and you work the logic off that response. In the example here, I have asked the user for their first, middle, and last names. Then I want to combine those into a full name variable. I do this because my form requires their full name in the caption, but then has separate lines for first, middle, and last somewhere else on the form. So I wanna be able to use a macro later in the interview, use their name, and say something like, Jessica, how many children do you have? But not everyone has a middle name, so that is not required in my field. If I don't test now for middle name, I could potentially have an extra blank space for client middle name if they don't answer that middle name variable. So instead, I test if the user has answered the middle name variable. If that comes back as true, I set full name to first plus middle plus last, else, so otherwise they have not answered it. If has answered middle name is false, I set their full name to just first and last name. The ordinal function displays the ordinal form of a number variable's value. It is generally used in a repeat loop to specify which iteration of the loop you're asking about. 
In this scenario, I'm using a repeat loop to gather the names and birth dates of the user's children. The first question asks for the child's name. To be very clear about which child's name I want, I use the ordinal function with the repeat loops counting variable. That's always a number, and you'll learn more about it in the repeat loop section that's coming up. Each time the loop increments, that number will go up one and the user will be shown the next ordinal version of the number. So it will say, what is the name of your second child? What is the name of your fifth child, etc. The last function to talk about is the newest. Contains is a function that looks at a text variable and returns a true or false value based on whether that text string contains whatever word or phrase you've asked. The syntax is a bit different than our other functions in that there are two parts to it. You have the word contains, then parentheses, and the text variable wrapped in brackets, but then there is a comma and the value that you're looking for in that text variable in quotes and then close parentheses. Here's an example where I've asked the end user to tell me about their legal problem. Within their answer, I want to know if they use the word violence. If they do, then I'll ask follow-up questions. We also have international authors who look for specific postal code combinations to branch users off based on jurisdiction. So this function can look into any text variable for any value that you designate, but it is what is specifically within those quotes. The full list of functions, including a couple lesser used ones that I didn't cover in today's training, is available in the A to J authoring guide on our website, www.a2jauthor.org, under chapter seven, creating questions. You can also find it directly at the URL, www.a2jauthor.org slash content slash functions. A couple reminders about the function syntax. Make sure to wrap your variable names in brackets and wrap those brackets in parentheses. Not all functions and all variables need it, but it doesn't hurt to use them, and when they're needed, the functions don't work without them. So I go by the rule of thumb of always including brackets and parentheses to be safe. That's it for functions. Next, we'll discuss the merge tool and how it can make your work of authoring much easier. The merge tool is an authoring hack that many authors don't know about. We added it in 2022, but I don't think it's as utilized as it could be. So I'll focus this training section on showing you the components of the merge tool and give you some examples of where it can be used to ease the burden on you as authors. The first thing to talk about is the normal workflow for interview creation. Generally, you have a paper form that you wanna automate, like the example on the far left. You highlight or mark up all the fields that need to be answered by the end user. Then you think about or draft a series of questions to fill in those blanks. The question drafting can be visual, like the flow chart in the middle, or it can be more of an outline format if you prefer a more linear approach. Sometimes it's a little bit of both, and sometimes it's a bunch of nothing and you just jump right into the authoring process in the software. I speak from experience here, but I find that some sort of outline and list of variables needed is helpful before I jump into A to J Author. If you want a refresher on scoping and building out a storyboard or an outline, go back to video one in this section. The great thing about our community of developers and the fact that A to J Author has been around since 2005 is that there are literally thousands of examples of interviews for you to look at when you begin your authoring process. You don't have to start from scratch, even if you're automating a form that's never been automated before. If you're using LawHelp Interactive to host your A to J guided interviews, their developer portal allows you to download the interview files from about a thousand A to J guided interviews and reuse them in your interviews using the merge tool, which I'll talk about in a second. If you're hosting on a2j.org, we have access to the interview files, and if there's an interview that you wanna duplicate or build upon, we can pull that and load it into your account for you. The A to J Author Document Assembly community is very open to sharing and emphasizes building upon the work of those that have come before us. Now let's talk about how to do that sharing. The merge tool was released in June 2022 with the idea that developers can use it to reduce the number of questions that they have to draft, to reuse components of interviews like logic, pages, variables, whole steps, etc. from others' interviews, and recycle work that they've already done on their own interviews into new ones. The merge tool allows you to select parts of an interview and merge them into another interview. It does the work of copying and pasting for you you access the merge tool from the interviews tab. The pink arrow is pointing out the merge interview component section. Before you start a merged interview, you need to have the interviews you want to copy from in your list of interviews. 
We have a couple basic examples you can pull from, but otherwise you will need to have the interviews in the edit one of my interviews section before you begin the merge process. If the interviews you want to pull from aren't already in your account, then you can upload them via the upload A to J guided interview button in the top toolbar. You'll upload the zipped interview file and it'll then show in your list of interviews here and within the merge tool. Once you have all the interviews you want to merge from, double click on the blue words that say merged interview, import components from a source interview into an existing or blank target interview. Once the merge tool opens, you'll need to pick the starting point interview. This is the interview that everything will be merged into. You can either start with an existing interview that you have, perhaps you've done some question drafting already, or built out your template. Or you can start with a brand new blank interview. Let's walk around this page a bit to show you the different options. Under step one, you can go to the sample A to J guided interviews if you want to start with one of those. That's a curated list of interviews that we think are good examples of A to J guided interviews in terms of their use of just-in-time learning features, plain language, question design, and they are all or were live interviews, so they're user tested. Under that, you can search for an interview by name, or you can scroll down and pick the interview you want to use. The top option is always the one called blank interview, which is the default interview that contains those four starter questions. However you find your starting interview, you select it by double clicking on it. If you decide that this isn't the route for you, you can always back out via the exit without saving button in the top right corner. Once you double click on the starting interview, step two opens up. Here you'll see your starting interview on the left hand side. You can see all the variables, pages, and everything that's currently in what will be the interview things are merged into. I've been trying to think of a good name for this interview that might be blank, might have some stuff in it, might be full of content that you're looking to add things to. I think I'll call it the core interview versus the other interview, which will be the component interview where we'll take components from. So the interview being merged into, that is getting stuff, will be called the core interview. The interview that is giving things that is being merged from will be the component interview. The zoomed in box with the blue border on the screen is what the interview pages section looks like if I'd scroll down a bit more in this core interview on the left. I can see literally everything in the core interview before I start adding things to it. On the right side of the screen is the actual step two of the merge tool. It's where you select the component interview. A cool feature of the merge tool is that you can pull from multiple component interviews. You just do it one component interview at a time. So you'll see this page again. Under the step two header, you can go to the sample A to J guided interviews, that curated list I mentioned a few slides ago, or search for an interview in your account by typing in a name, or you can scroll to the one that you wanna select in the alphanumerically organized list. Once you find your source component interview, double click on it to open it up. On the right hand side now, that source component interview is open, and you can see everything that's in it. This shows you all the variables, steps, pages, pop-ups, and templates in this interview. You can select all of them or just some of them. In this short video, you can see me expanding and collapsing the different parts of the component interview in order to see more granular details about this interview's parts. In some merge scenarios, you'll want to take the entire interview or almost all of it. In other cases, you may only want one page, whatever it is. This section of the merge tool lets you see everything about that component interview. Once you've reviewed all of the components, you check the ones that you want merged into your core interview. You'll notice that there are counts after the interview variables, steps and pages section, each step and pop-ups, and those counts are in parentheses. Those counts are how many of those things are in the component interview. When you select a step or a page, A to J author automatically brings along any variables used in that page. So in this screenshot, for example, I have 92 of a possible 288 variables selected, two of the eight steps and 43 of the 43 and eight of the eight pages selected within those two steps. I also have four out of the 12 pop-ups selected. When I'm ready to merge, there are two options. There's Merge Selected and Safe Merge Selected. Safe Merge Selected has a green arrow here because it's my preferred option. It'll merge your selected components into the core interview, 
But if there is a conflict in the core interview, like there's already a page named whatever the new page is going to be, or a variable with the same name exactly as the one that you are trying to merge, the safe merge selected option will append a ZZZ to the name so it is technically a different name. You can clean that up later in your interview if you want. Straight merge selected will overwrite any conflicting variable names, page names, templates, or pop-ups in the core interview. So the merge component wins in that fight. I'd hate to see hard work accidentally overwritten because you didn't realize that there would be a conflict, so I always pick safe merge. On this screen, you can also see the cancel, choose a different source button if you don't want anything from this component interview, and the exit without saving button at the top. That kicks you out of the merged interview experience altogether. Once I hit my merge button, my merged components are put into the core interview and I'm taken back to that page where I can select another interview to pull from or finish up. You can check that all of your merged components are now part of the core interview by scrolling through it again, but quickly from looking at the interview variables, you'll see that it's now up to 115. I had 23 variables that came by default with a blank interview and I merged in 92, which gives me 115. At this point, I can add more components by selecting another source interview to pull from and going through that whole process again, or I can be done. Secret third option is to undo the previous merge if you made a mistake. But let's assume you're all done and you're ready to save this new Frankenstein's monster of an interview. You're going to click the finished save my interview blue button. This will take you back to the interviews tab and highlight your new merged interview in the list of all of your interviews. You can then open up the interview and see that it has the, all of the merged components that you wanted. From this point, you can then edit, move around, or add to the interview sections to make it fit just right for your needs. The merge tool lets you build on the work of others in this community while still allowing you to customize the interview to your form and jurisdiction. The final area to cover in this part is repeat loops. Repeat loops are also sometimes called repeat dialogues. They are a series of questions that will be displayed to the end user multiple times based upon the user's inputs. Why would you need or want to use repeat loops in an A to J guided interview? You use repeat loops if you're trying to gather the same type of information multiple times from the end user. It saves you having to create multiple versions of the same question over and over. You allow your end user to go through the series of questions as many times as they need. Commonly, repeat loops are used to gather information about a user's children, their income sources, or their expenses. These are the types of questions where you might have a couple follow-up questions about a child or an expense, and you need to know that same information about all of their children or all of their expenses. But you don't know when you're creating the interview how many of those children's or expenses a user will have. A repeat loop lets you build it once and reuse the pages as many times as needed by each end user. There are two ways to make repeat loops with an A to J author. The first is to ask for the number of items or people or times through the loop upfront. The user tells you how many times they'll need to go through it and you set that in logic. The second way is to take the user through the loop questions, then ask them if they have any more to add at the end. If they say yes, they go through the loop again. If they say no, they branch out of the loop. I'll explain how to do each method and why you'd choose one way over another, depending on the type of information you're trying to collect. We'll talk first about collecting the number up front. You use this method when the end user can tell you right away how many times they'll need to go through the series of repeated questions. For example, you're asking them how many children they have. You ask for the number before they jump into the repeat loop, and then you use logic to evaluate whether they've hit that target number each time they complete the loop. This how many question is the jumping off point for the loop, but it won't be repeated each time they go through the loop. There are seven steps to creating a repeat loop when you're asking for the number up front. We'll break down each one of these in the next couple slides. Step one is to create the series of pages that will be repeated. You can do this on the pages tab or on the map tab. The screenshot here includes a repeat loop with three questions. The how many question, then two loop questions related to the user's children. The second step is to create the counting variable. This counting variable tracks how many times the user has gone through the loop. The counting variable in this example is child count. You'll notice it's a little different from the naming convention I've talked about before. 
Child and count are both capitalized, and there's no space between the words. There's also no two-letter indicator of this variable type. This is intentional. Let's me quickly differentiate counting variables from other variables in a long list. However you name them, counting variables should always be a number variable type. Even though they are part of a repeat loop, do not check the box that says check if multiple values. Your counting variable should only hold one value at a time. Step three is to ask the how many question. The variable behind this question should be something like number of children and you, another normal number variable. This page isn't technically part of the repeat loop. It's the jumping off point, but it's only going to be asked once. Step four is to initialize the counting variable. This sets the counting variable to one to prep it to start tracking the number of times the user has gone through the repeat loop. So on that how many question, your continue button is going to set counting variable to one, and you'll tell A to J author what counting variable to initialize. In this screenshot, it's child count. Again, this is under the button section of the how many question. The destination for this button is then the first page of the set of pages to be repeated. That is the first page of the repeat loop. For my example here, that's seven dash name of child ordinal. Step five is to tag each of the pages to be repeated with the counting variable. You do this by scrolling down to the bottom of the page info section in the question design editor. There's a field called counting variable. Then you either type in the name of the counting variable or search for it in the list of all the variables there. You will know you've properly tagged it as a repeating page when it shows up in the page list with the red circle arrow icon and the word loop. This is only used for the pages you want repeated to the end user. In my example, name and birth date pages are repeated. It is not used on the how many question. Step six and seven are done in the last page of your set of repeated pages. On that last page, scroll down to the button section. You've initialized the counting variable and now you need to increment it. So step six is to select increment counting variable from the repeat options in the button section and add the counting variable to the counting variable field underneath that repeat option. When the user presses the continue button on this page, the counting variable will increase by one, indicating that the user has successfully completed the loop. The final step is to create the logic that will test if your end user has gone through the loop as many times as they said they needed to. On that same last loop page that we just talked about with step six, scroll down to the logic section. Here, you'll script a condition that tests if the counting variable equals the variable that was set by the user in the how many question. In this example, if number of children and you equals child count, I am going to branch the user to the next set of questions, moving them out of the loop. Else, so they have not gone through the loop enough times, I am going to branch them back to the first page of my loop. Now let's talk about how to create repeat loops when the user might not know how many times they need to go through the loop of pages. This method is called asking to add more at the end. With this method, you take the user through the series of repeating pages, then ask them on the final repeating page whether they need to go through the loop again. The example I'll use here is a series of pages that asks the user about their monthly expenses. The user knows they have expenses and can build out a list explaining what they are and how much they cost, but they aren't likely to know right away that it's seven or 12 expenses that they need to tell me about. This method lets you help them build out that list, shows them what they've told you about already, and can even tally up the total for them. The asking to add more method only has five steps. Step one is the same as the how many method where you create the series of pages that will be repeated. Here I have a jumping off page where I ask the end user if they even need to go into the repeat loop. It's the one, do you have any question. Then I have the name of the expense, the amount of the expense, and the any more question. The name, cost, and any more page will all be repeated. The do you have any page will only be shown to the end user once. Step two is to create the counting variable. Again, it should be a number variable and should not be set to hold multiple values. For my example here, it's called expense count. Step three is to initialize your counting variable on the do you have any question. This is the jumping off point for your repeat loop, but it's only shown to the end user once. This page isn't strictly necessary because you could initialize the counting variable on any page before the repeat loop. However, it's best practices to ask your end user if they need to enter the loop. For example, the page asks, do you have any monthly expenses? 
If the user clicks the yes button, they are taken into the loop and the counting variable expense count will be initialized. If they say no, they are branched around the loop and the counting variable isn't touched. So for the yes button, you set the destination to the first repeating question, that's name of expense in this example, and you set the counting variable to one and tell A to J author which counting variable to use. On every question to be repeated, you tag it as a repeating question by putting the counting variable in the counting variable field of the question text. The final step is two parts. One deals with the yes button and one deals with the no button. On that do you have any more question, which is the final question in your repeat loop, you should have two buttons. One for the yes and one for the no. On the yes button, which means the user does want to go through the loop again, you increment the counting variable, tell A to J which counting variable to use, and set the destination for that button to the first repeated question. On the no button, you can ignore the repeat options and set the destination to a page outside the loop. This screenshot is showing two best practices that go along with the method of creating repeat loops. The first is the learn more. The user is creating this list of expenses with you and may not remember all the ones that they have told you about already. Just at the point in which they have to decide if they want to add more, show them a learn more that says, what expenses have I already told you about? And use a macro to call up all the values held by the variable for the expenses name. So if the user clicks the learn more, they'd see something like, you've told me about your rent, car payment, health insurance, and daughter's music lesson. It's easy for you as the author to add this, but it can make a world of difference for the end user in the moment completing this A to J guided interview. The second best practice is in the question text itself. After the do you have any more question, I've included a sentence that tells the user the total of their monthly expenses they've already told me about. When authoring, I rely on my own lived experience to cr help create what I'd want to see. I know how much I roughly spend a month on bills. So if I saw a total that was well below what I know to be my monthly total, I'd know for sure that I needed to tell this interview about more monthly expenses. So I use the sum function to add up all the values held by a variable like expense cost NU, and then display it to the end user with a macro. With that, we finished creating our repeat loops using the ask to add more method, and we finished the repeat loop section. Thanks for sticking with me through these bonus features and a hodgepodge of authoring skills. We're almost done learning how to create the interview. The final part of section three is conditional logic. Stay tuned.